When I was in my mid-twenties, I was doing a side job as a nuisance wildlife trapper for the Florida Fish and Wildlife Commission. It was in the middle of summer, and I got a call from a local park. The FWC had just stocked the youth fishing pond, and they noticed some otter tracks. So they called me, because otters would quite literally decimate the fish population. I have to contact the manager and let them know I'll be on the property at odd times because of my primary job. I only used live traps so that I could relocate the animal to a safer pond. So the first night, I went with my friend Scott decided to go with me to see how I set the traps and track them to find where to set the traps. So we're hanging out on the little bridge that crosses the natural inlet into the pond in order to give ourselves cover and see if this is how they are entering the water without being seen by the massive amounts of people that are at this park daily. So we're having a casual conversation about life when I notice someone coming down the path to our right. Okay, that's fine. It's a public park and people are allowed in certain areas after sundown. Nothing weird about that. If it had been a whale walking down the sidewalk, that would have really caught my attention. So I mentioned someone is heading this way. We better stand up so as not to scare them. We both came out, and now is when things get a little odd. This person is wearing long pants and a hoodie in August. I'm sitting still and dripping sweat. How is this person standing? That's when it gets close enough for me to notice I can't see their face. My buddy turns us back to the thing and continues talking. I can't take my eyes off of it. When it gets within, I'd say, six feet of me, it no longer has legs and starts slowly fading out. And when it gets to a certain spot, it fades out completely. My friend goes quiet and asks me what happened to the guy and turns and looks at me. He says something along the lines of, Dude, why are you so white? It looks like you just saw a ghost. Oh shit. All I could say was, He's gone, man. He puffed. Just vanished. Nothing. I turn around and he's running as fast as he can to the truck. I start looking around trying to find this guy anywhere. Scott is screaming for me to get in the truck. To hell with this place. I take off running to get to the truck and we get the hell out of the Dodge. We get to his house and he grabs his roommate's rosary beads and starts praying. I just sit down and tell him we have to get back. He says not without extra protection. So we plan on taking our friend Colby with us the next night, but we decide to talk to the manager first to try and find out if anything weird has happened before. But we're expecting her to call us crazy and kick us out. We went back the next day and talked to the manager. She tells us that a local vet's office had put a memorial up for a young guy that was troubled and worked for them, caring for the animals. He had killed himself. Then she said something that gave me chills. She said he always wore a hoodie and was kind of to himself and what she considered emo. She tells us to bring cameras tonight and see if we can catch anything besides an animal. So we plan our little excursion, get a digital camera, pick up Colby and head out later that night. For some reason, I'm not thinking of wearing flip-flops. So we took pictures and video for about an hour in the area we saw him and got nothing. So we decided to go down the trail we saw him walk out of. We get probably a hundred yards down the wooded trail and I decide to have a pee. So I tell them to hold up a second while I do my business. The trail is partially lit, but still pretty dark. The most lighting comes from the ambient light from the park. Suddenly, I see a shadow step out from the woods. It comes onto the trail and starts walking away. I tell the guys to walk back and forth because I think I might be seeing the backlighting casting shadows down the trail, and I've lost sight of the figure due to the job at hand. So we walked a couple of yards up the trail, and it hit me that if it was a person, why didn't they make any noise walking down a paved path? Suddenly, we see the shadow ahead of us, and we're going to overtake it so as to keep from startling a person on a poorly lit trail. I yell out, coming up behind you. I just didn't want to surprise anyone. Then it stops dead, and we stop dead, because we notice that it's close to a light, and it's a solid black human figure. We're roughly a hundred feet away, and it turns around, 
and all three of us see two red eyes glaring back at us. So my buddy Scott goes, hey, we don't want any trouble, man. Then it starts pacing back and forth across the trail very quickly and we start talking. I asked what its name was and it just continued pacing. So finally, I get the nerve to take a few steps forward when suddenly it actually gets larger in size and turns toward us again with large red eyes and has what I would consider a threatening posture. So I back off and it stays the size but starts pacing again but now it has no legs. So we asked questions again and still nothing. I decided to move forward again and found out that was a mistake. As soon as I get close, it turns its face, now white with a dark body, mouth wide open. It starts charging. I bolt, running as fast as I can down the path and fly by my friends. And they're screaming, turning to run. I beat everyone to the truck. I see them running down the trail because I have the truck lights on and shining the lights down the trail. This thing is hot on their trail and they're almost to the truck. I'm so scared I've lost gross motor skills completely and can't put the key in the ignition. This thing is starting to get close enough to touch them. Scott does this weird spin throw move almost like he took a swing at it. Then it stops and turns around. Now it's glowing like pulsing light and going back down the trail. They hit the door and I've now cranked the trunk and it stops and turns back. I'm not about to find out what the fuck it is. So I throw it in reverse and haul ass. As we're going down the road and start talking, I notice my feet are killing me. That's when I realized I actually had run out of my flip flops. I asked Scott where the camera is. He had thrown it at the thing right before it turned around, pulsing with light. I have no idea what it was, and to this day, I don't know if anyone ever found my flip-flops or the camera. Nor do I really give a damn, because I won't go back. I'm 37 now, and this happened many years ago when I was 9, maybe 10. This happened in the church I grew up in. I grew up in a decent sized church that was founded around 1757. So to say this place had a lot of history is an understatement. Our church had a basement that our fellowship hall and kitchen along with the youth group room was in. Beside the youth group room was what we called a prayer room. Basically a small room with a single pew and a small altar for meditation and prayer. I had always heard rumours from the other kids that there was a ghost in the prayer room, but just chalked it up as imaginations in a dark hallway and room. My pastor, whom I adored, was a very honest and loving man. He often came to our home with his wife to visit. I looked at them as grandparents, and they treated my brother, sister, and myself as their grandchildren. When I asked him about it, he said that he thought he had seen someone in there once. But when he went in to check on them, no one was there. But he wasn't worried about it, because it seemed to be praying and was peaceful, so he didn't think I should worry. So a few weeks pass, and we're having a lock-in. For those that don't know, that's where all the kids and the youth pastor and some of the parents spend the night at the church and play games, watch movies, and eat together. We were all sleeping in the youth group room, and as children often do, I faked sleep and waited for everyone to go to sleep because I wanted to see if I could see this figure. Everyone falls asleep, and I get up and ease out the door into the now long, very dark hallway. I stand there trying to psych myself up, when I hear whispering coming from the direction of the room. Just very faint, and I'm thinking maybe I'm not the only one who has this idea. So I put my hand on the wall, and use it as a guide, because it's so dark. You can just barely see the light coming in from the outside windows through the door. The door to the room has a small square window to see in. I'm just tall enough to be able to see in. As I get closer, the whispering is just slightly louder, so I'm thinking maybe someone from the youth group has snuck in there with a friend and is trying to be quiet so as not to get into trouble. I reach out and push down on the handle to open it, but it's locked and won't budge. 
and wondering why they would lock themselves in when I move forward and look through the window. When I see it, I can't tell if it's male or female. Just a figure with its back to the kneeling at the altar with its head down. I can see the light from the window through it. I jumped back, realising what I had just seen. I'm wanting to run and scream, but I'm scared it will chase me. So I just stood frozen. Then I notice the whispering stops, and I peep back in, and the room is empty. Thinking in my head this entity is watching me, waiting to pounce. I run like hell back down the hallway, go back in the room, and spend the rest of the night hiding under the covers. So for a little background, after getting a divorce, I met my now fiancé almost a year ago. I always felt she was an empath, but also possibly clairvoyant. She doesn't want anything to do with it, it scares the living shit out of her. However, she used to do astral projects as a child. She told me she did it every night until she was a teen. My aunt died before we met, so I never told her about her. We were very close, my aunt and I. My dad died a month before my uncle passed of prostate cancer. She would take me fishing all the time with her. Through that, we found solace and kept each other from being so depressed. I loved her and looked up to her. When she passed, I was unable to go to her funeral. I lived 10 hours away and couldn't get it off work. I felt incredibly guilty and upset due to that. My fiancé and I had fallen asleep in our usual position her head on my shoulder, arm across my leg over me. When she woke up and hugged me and woke me up saying, babe, I need to ask you something. I of course told her to go ahead and she goes, did you have an aunt named Rachel that passed away? Then described her to a T. At this point I was in shock and said that I did. She then told me, well, she came to me in a dream, hugged me and told me to tell you that she was okay and to stop worrying. She loves you dearly and that she understands and is okay. She's never seen a picture nor have I ever told her about my great aunt. Needless to say, she held me as I cried for a good 10 minutes. She was able to bring me closure for something she had no clue about. I moved away from my parents and into my first apartment. It's a good location. Close to town, beach and forest with lots of water. Perfect for long walks and nature stuff. The forest bit has a lot of swamp area and direct access to flowing water on one side. It's about two and a half kilometers long by 500 meters wide. It's not the biggest forest, but it's the creepiest. I've walked many times in the past through forests at nighttime and I found it quite cosy, and the darkness is very good for my light-sensitive eyes. I haven't been scared in the past forests, as far as I can remember. I remember the first time walking through this tiny forest, and I knew instantly that there was something not quite right. This was at daytime, though. You know the expression, the forests have eyes? In this case, it's quite literal. You feel watched as soon as you enter and until you leave on the other side. The forest is so thin at times, you can see the water on the other side and know that you're alone. Yet, it feels like a thousand eyes are following your every move. I thought that it was just forest paranoia. But every time I come here, and it doesn't matter what time of the year, it's the same. Even dogs I meet on my way with their owners seem upset all the time. I was walking through it one evening to see if I could find the peace, which I usually could in other forests at night time, but that was a hard no. Not only did the eyes of the forest feel more appealing, but there was a feeling of dread there, which wasn't there at daytime at all. I started noticing balls of light, some big and others very small floating in between the trees. First, I thought that it was some sort of insect or maybe boats on the water, but after checking the water, there never were any boats. I just hurried home. I've been back to the forest both alone and with people, and all the time we notice the balls of light. But they're on a hill where the path is at the top, 
and the hill goes about 10 to 12 meters down and then meets the water. The balls are floating seven to 10 meters above ground level in and out between trees. I don't like entering the forest anymore and I'll do my very best to avoid it. It's evil. The forest ends up to my parents' area from my prior memory. And I'm not sure about its backstory since most of it is mouth to mouth. Well, I'll look into it as soon as I can. I'm a 29 year old woman. For years now, I've been having premonition dreams. I never know when they'll happen and they never have involved myself until last night. I also regularly travel to the fifth dimension, which also plays a strong part in what I'm about to tell you. Within my family, we believe that we're not fully human. We believe that we're from a fifth dimensional race who inhabit human bodies and have for almost the, the entire existence of the human race. We also believe that we are reincarnated into different people and live that person's life in order to experience this world fully. Each of us has memories of previous lives, but I'm the only one in my family who has memories from the first moment I inhabited somebody's body. Over the centuries, I've done that hundreds and hundreds of times over. But last night, last night, I saw one of the places where a previous body of mine was buried. I saw the gravestone of my previous self. Within the fifth dimension is a river known as the River of Memories where all souls have to walk through. And if they keep even one finger above the water, that soul will keep some of the memories from his or his previous life. But the river isn't only for taking memories to make you a blank slate for your next life. It can also return memories that you wish to live through again. The problem is that if a part of you is submerged, you must give up a memory to receive a memory. I dipped my hand in the river last night and I saw my funeral from 200 plus years ago. I saw my friends and family standing around my grave, but I didn't recognize them. As I mentioned before, to gain a memory, you have to give up a memory. I'm sitting in my living room and I have no idea when or where I had a hanging picture in my living room taken. When I was 17, I was dating a girl who I'll just refer to as Kate. Kate is a friend that's super into the paranormal. One day, the three of us were hanging out with a few other people when a friend, who I'll call Sarah, had the bright idea of holding a seance. We all agreed to do it, thinking fuck all would happen. We began the seance, and surprisingly enough, after a couple of attempts, we were successful. We decided it was time to call it quits and moved on to play Uno. We're maybe two rounds in and the living room temperature dropped. It wasn't a crazy difference, but it was noticeable enough for us to ask Sarah to turn off her AC. Sarah got up and as she was walking towards the thermostat, a picture that was hanging on the wall beside it fell. We all heard it fall, but didn't think much of it. After she put it back up, the picture that was hanging on top of it fell. Then two more, and then the last picture on the wall fell. She turned to look at us and had a sarcastic, scared look on her face. Her sarcasm quickly turned to genuine concern when a TV, which was mounted on the wall, fell. It was after that moment that the lights began to flicker in and out softly. I stood up, ready to bail, when the lights completely went out. The coffee table we were all sitting around began to shake, causing us to back the fuck away. We all ran out to the patio door and into the backyard to calm down. After 10 minutes, me and the only other guy there decided to be heroes and go inside to see what would happen. We walked throughout the house, seeing if we would trigger anything. Thankfully, nothing happened. We invited the girls back in and tried to think of a believable reason for her TV bro broken. To the best of my knowledge, nothing else has happened in a house again.
Here's a tale that comes from a little town in Lancaster County, called Elizabeth Town. It's called the Purple Light Bridge, and it's been a story that started in the early 1900s. It could be more than a tale though, since there is proof of the purple light and the tragic tale behind it. So one of the tales is that a young boy is struck by a train on the bridge that intersects between Turnpike Road and High Street, which is where the train station for Amtrak is. It supposedly happened in 1934, and some people claim there's proof of the accident, but I personally am looking into it. I emailed the Historical Society. So after the boy's death, it is said late at night, you can see a purple light on the bridge, or in the gorge where the train tracks runs into from the north, heading southwest. People like to argue you can see the purple lights at another location, and it's been there and not by the train station. They claim that you can see the lights under the bridge that is above the train tracks on Bosler Road. Bosler Road for the purple light had another tail. A mother brought her son to the bridge and under that bridge, she hung her son by herself. Locals say that the purple light you see is the mother and son. Some people have claimed the purple light comes from the moonlight reflecting off the rocks below the ridge. Yet even more people claim that it's actually the bridge a couple of miles away in Newville, near Elizabethtown. I have not yet tried to investigate, but will update the findings on this page. Apparently, there's a man there who has video of these lights that hasn't contacted me back. Now we come to what has been said to me to be on par with most haunted places in Strasbourg with the Gondor Mansion. Funny thing about this story is that it was my first adventure in high school. Me, along with my brother, our friends Ethan and Human checked it out. This was before it was renovated and turned into a house which there are now local residents that live inside and turned it into a very beautiful property. At the time we went ghost hunting, and even went into the abandoned house at the time. The house had a horse stable, a pond, and even once had a clubhouse that a local boy scout troop made as I was told. We didn't find any ghosts, until we left and shined a light into the basement, and saw a figure with a red material that freaked us out, which we thought may have been a curtain. But when we thought about it, there weren't any curtains we noticed when we were there, so that freaked us out. Another tale is from a friend who actually lives by there. He one time went there to camp with his uncle. They both set up a fire, waited till sundown. He told me that when sleeping, he heard something outside and they checked it out and found nothing. They dismissed it as just a squirrel or any animal that would be running around at night. Upon getting in the tent though, he let out a scream because he felt someone grab his shoulder behind him while his uncle was in front of him. They both left and never went there at night again. So you're probably thinking, why is this place called Hell's Funnel and how did it get its name? It happened with only one day in the early 20th century. While working, when the property used to be a sawmill, there was an accident where a man slipped and the saw blades dismembered either his hand or whole arm. The property is on the outskirts of Strasbourg, so getting to a hospital wasn't much of an option. So the man instead rushed home and sat on the front porch to see us one last time. His wife instead only saw her husband suffer and eventually bleed out and die. His wife, going into a depressed state, decided then to take her own life, to be her husband. The property is said to be haunted by the both of them. The pond by the house is said to have spirits seen over the top of the water. There are also stories of a woman's spirit walking around the area of the pond, or on top of the surface too. Some people claim to have been scratched by something while approaching the pond or grabbed. My friends, who I mentioned before, camped by that pond when he was grabbed. So it was more substance when I hear people claim that. Yet that's only one of the stories I've heard. There's another with a way darker turn. This one starts just like the first story of the man cutting off his hand or arm with a saw blade while cutting a log. 
It was his good hand that he used to work with too. So not being able to work his job due to his disability, the sawmill fired him. Eventually, not being able to work, this angered the man. So with his other hand, he picked up an axe and headed back to the sawmill. Seeking revenge, he hacked up all of the workers at the time, then took his own life. Story has it that all those souls became trapped there, forming a funnel right to hell. That's why you see spirits there, because they're damned souls that escaped hell, and one's on their way into hell. Or perhaps the souls the man killed lingering in the place, trapped where they were killed. If you look at the trees, there as well above the road, they curve inward. So this house I lived in for a short time as a kid was always very dark. All the shadows seemed to lean on the house. My parents' bedroom didn't have a window either. One night, I was sleeping in the basement because that was where my room was. And from a very deep sleep, suddenly my eyes popped open. And I had that feeling like someone was standing in the room. It was really weird because this only happens to me even as an adult when someone comes into the room while I'm asleep. I was really confused. Looked around and didn't see anything and tried to sleep. I just couldn't. So I decided I was going to get up and go pee. There was only one washroom in the house and it was on the first floor next to my parents' room. Got up, headed for the door. Before I reached the door, the door slammed shut. I'm terrified at this moment. I reached for the handle and turned the knob and pulled on the door. And it wouldn't open. I kept trying to pull on the door, getting frantic. I was very strong as a kid. The door was bowing for me pulling on the door, like someone was holding it shut above my head. I remember screaming, let me out, mom, dad. Nobody could hear me. I eventually managed to get the door open and flew up the stairs to the bathroom, flicked on the light, then went to my parents' room and tried to open the door, but it was locked. I tried banging on the door asking to let me in. I ended up staying in the bathroom for probably an hour because it's the only place I felt safe with the light. I was even scared to go out in the living room, which I eventually did to grab a pillow and a blanket and slept on the bathroom floor with the light on. In the morning, my parents found me and asked me why I wasn't in bed and instead upstairs in the bathroom. I told them what happened. My parents said they heard nothing. Not me screaming, not me banging on the door trying to get in. My dad, of course, didn't believe me. My mum did, though. I refused to ever sleep in the basement again. My dad was mad and I didn't care. I slept on the couch for weeks, sometimes in front of their door or in the bathroom because I was so scared. Until they would bring my bed upstairs. Many things happened in this house and the area is very old. I lived in this house for a very short time while I was in kindergarten. This is an old town, one of the first in my province. This will be a telling of three different experiences. Around Christmas time, the weather was fair. It wasn't windy or too cold. I was watching a TV show. I do believe it was Letters to Santa or something. It was on YTV. I was sitting in front of the TV watching my show with the remote beside me. And the TV would flip to the news. A little confused, I would swap it back with the remote. And after a couple of minutes, it would swap to the news again. I was getting a little annoyed, so I called out to my mum, who was in the kitchen, and asked why she kept swapping the channel, and if she wanted me to watch something else. She looked right at me, and said the remote is beside you. I'm not touching the TV, which it was. Right after, I asked her this, the TV started to flip through a bunch of channels. Then our old touch lamp started to act up. Like someone kept touching it and turning it all the way up, and off all the way up, and off over and over. And then it kept swapping through all the channels. A little freaked out, I yelled, stop, switch it back to my show and stop messing with the lamp. Immediately it stopped and flipped it back to my channel. Nothing like this happened to me again. My mum watched the whole thing. 
and I remember turning to her, shrugging in my shoulders. My mum also told me she had been experiencing the light being turned off in the kitchen. And it couldn't have just been the power, because the light switch would be off. And this would happen to her all the time while she was just in the kitchen making food. Figure over my bed. This was shortly after I had asked my parents to move my bed upstairs. I was laying in bed with the street lights coming in the window. And I woke up to a really cold breeze in my bed. Not thinking much, I looked around and saw nothing. And suddenly my curtains, which were the gauzy white see-through ones, flew up over my bed. Like some strong breeze came from under my bed and threw them over the top of me. It was weird. But weirder they fell over the figure of a woman standing by my bed. It scared me. I sat upright and pulled the curtain out of the way so I could see better. And there was no one there. I was terrified, but I just threw my blankets over my head and went to sleep. And just said, go away, go away. Closed my eyes real tight. Cowbone in the muck. More creepy, less supernatural. So as a kid, I was all about getting dirty and playing in the mud. I would find mud pits, get as dirty as humanly possible, and then go back home. Change and wash and come back. I had gone out into this mud pit that was right across the street from my house. My parents had left me at home. But this was a small town, and everyone watched everyone's kids. So I'm out playing in the muck up to my knees in mud, digging around, and I happened to find a cow bone. I pulled it out, and as I was making my way back to the street, I sank into some mud up to my hips and couldn't get out. A nice guy came by and fished me out with a shovel, asked me if I was okay. Everything was cool. When my parents got home, I showed them the bone and we cleaned it off. Later on, me and my friends made a ford outside made of twigs. It was pretty awesome. I put my cow bone in it, and came back the next day. While we were looking at the cow bone, we noticed something weird about it, and I went to pick it up, and thousands, thousands of daddy long legs came pouring out of this bone. We promptly, then shortly after that, wasps took it over, so it had to be torn down. A couple weeks go by, and I'm laying on the floor at my house, sleeping. My aunt's sitting beside me, and I feel tickling. I giggle, and I say to my aunt, stop. She says, honey, I'm not tickling you. So I go back to sleeping. More tickling. I say, auntie, please stop. I'm trying to sleep. And she says, I'm not tickling you. I pull the blanket I'm under, and I'm covered in daddy long legs. I scream, hop up, start crying, and brush them off and run to my mum. My mum says, it's okay, they're harmless. They won't follow you. Well... They followed me across the floor to my mum, and even my mum was freaked out. I hated that house so much for all the creepy stuff that happened. The first apartment I lived in after I got married was located in what's known as the NoHo Arts District. It was a nice one bedroom built most likely in the 1920s. We loved the one bedroom. The only thing I didn't like was that it was in the front of the building's first floor, 10 feet from the sidewalk with no fence. Having lived in lesser areas, it made me slightly nervous. The energy of the place was good, until about four months in. I woke up to the footsteps in the hardwood floors in the living room. I could hear them clearly, as did my wife once she got up. I could hear things being shuffled and more cautious steps. I pulled an old 45 that I kept in my dresser and waited facing the bedroom door. There was a one inch gap between the door and floor, I assume because it was once carpeted. We both could see the shadows of the person walking past the door. They went past the bathroom at the end of the hallway. Then nothing. It became silent and I decided that I had to deal with this in an unfriendly way and opened the door and turned to the bathroom. Nothing. No one was there or anywhere. All the windows were locked and the chain on the doors were on. I had a hard time sleeping that night. A few months later, it happened again, but that time 
As I touched the door handle, I could hear the front door open and then slam closed. The chain was hitting the door when it slammed. When I checked everything, it was the same, all locked, but the front door chain was also locked and had heard it bouncing on the door. It never happened again. And we moved to the end of the lease, despite what I thought initially was paranormal or a ghost. Last week, I started feeling like a cold was coming on. I tested negative then within 12 hours. I was really sick and then tested positive. The first few days were like a blur, sleeping in and out all throughout the day. I self-quarantined in my bedroom away from the rest of my family. I didn't leave my bedroom for almost five days. I don't know which night it was, but it was probably Sunday or Monday. I woke up to someone standing in my room. It first looked like a tall, thin person draped in black and with a hood on. But then I saw it was a woman standing there, all in black and with long hair. I sat there in shock, just sweating out so much that sweat was dripping from my chin and nose. I looked at her and she just stood there. Her shape was almost giving off fumes, like there wasn't a fine line to her outline, if that makes sense. Attached to my master bedroom is my master bathroom and inside there is a nightlight that turns on when motion detected. Well, that light triggered and turned on, so I turned to look at the bathroom doorway and the light. As soon as I turned back to look at the lady standing in my room, she was gone. Only a jacket hanging behind the door was there. I don't know how to explain it, but the jacket was there and has been there for weeks. But that wasn't the dark shape that I saw. The dark shape was closer, like toward the edge of the bed to me. Then all of a sudden, the motion light in the bathroom went off and I was sitting there in darkness. I reached around for the TV remote and the t turned the TV on and then reached over and turned on my side table light and stayed up until I guess I went to sleep again, which wasn't that long. It was all during my COVID times. I seemed to fall asleep a lot. Maybe it was the virus that made me see something but I know what I saw and I know that lights came on in the bathroom. I think had I not been so sick at the moment, I would have been more terrified. To say the least, things got quiet for a while and we became hopeful that all the steps we took drove the ghost off. I wasn't able to take all the advice given because some of it just wasn't a means we could do. Leaving a home you pay for when you already struggle isn't easy. Cash is tight and paying for elsewhere isn't possible. So while doing my own research, I was able to get the house cleansed. Afterwards, the continued ignorance of its presence went on strongly. Standing our ground, over some time, things happened less and less. Then eventually, it stopped altogether. It almost became a thing of the past for a bit there. I felt we all started to move on and push the memories back. That was until last night. I first noticed a heavy energy in my room as I was doing my routine for bed. The entire time I washed my face, I felt like someone was standing behind me, watching. I shrugged it off and blamed it on my own head. I continued on to do my skincare routine when I thought I could feel my robe being brushed open. It made my heart jump in my throat. That lightning chill went up my spine and all the hairs on my body sank. I tried to swallow the feelings coming over me and push on, so push on I did. It was around 1.30am when I finally got into bed to sleep. However, the intrusive feeling lingered around the room. Everything I was doing felt like eyes were all over the room, watching. I got on my phone and started to chat with friends. I checked a few things to make plans for the coming sunrise. That's when I heard this clicking noise next to me. At first, when I looked to my right, it just looked like my normal closet door and bathroom door closed. I set down my phone and tried to focus on the TV that was playing on it. I checked my phone around 2.53am as I was exhausted from not being able to sleep. I sat up slightly for a drink of water and that's when I first noticed it. The closet door began to slowly open as I looked over. You could hear the door's normal squeak. 
as it continued to open, I sat in my bed and in the sheets. I closed my eyes and slowly turned my back towards it to lie on my left side. The sound of my heart could be heard beating out of my chest as I kept telling myself, it's nothing, there's a logical explanation you just haven't seen yet because you're tired, get to sleep. I repeated that a few times, telling myself to go to sleep. Moments had passed and I had calmed my breathing, feeling relaxed enough to drift into sleep finally. It felt like something was in the bed with me, just breathing on the back of my neck. A helpless feeling came over me, so I jumped up and turned my light on. Walked to the closet door, turned its lights on, and opened it. I walked inside, and this feeling, it felt like overwhelming loneliness, just surrounding me. If I hadn't walked out of there and closed the door, I would have sunk into the door and cried right then and there. Getting back into my bed felt different than it did just hours ago. I did feel fear or anxiety anymore. I turned on my right side and faced the closet until I fell asleep. As I woke up, everything felt normal. In fact, I actually feel good today, like I'm full of energy and I shouldn't have on only roughly four hours of sleep. I guess I'll see how it goes from here. I want to say I was at least 11 at the time. My parents would always take us to my grandparents' house. My father worked for my grandfather, and they lived out in BFE. There was nothing for miles and miles. If you were to scream, nothing would hear you. So when we would visit, it was a guarantee that we were staying a while. They always stuck us kids in the back room. This room is pretty much the storage room of the house. Anything that was to be packed away and out of sight made its way back there. Boxes of old pictures, toys, clothes over the years were all scattered throughout the room. Tall shelves filled with non-perishable items. An extremely tall standing deep freezer took up a decent side of the wall by the door and made enough noise to even wake the dead. There were two beds near the back of the room. One was a queen bed that was on a high metal bed frame. Then next to that was a small twin nudged into the corner. Between these beds was a small nightstand with a touch lamp that sat up in, upon it. Then there was the closet. It was such an odd little walk-in closet. No clothes were ever hung in there. But there were many more boxes of old knickknacks, vinyls, etc. that seemed to be tossed there and forgotten about. At night, that closet had more than a few boxes of junket on it. I always hate sleeping closest to the closet. I've had this unnerving feeling like something was waiting to pounce on me at any moment of the night. When the moonlight would shine through the window and hit the boxes just right, it would look like a man in a top hat, standing in the very corner of the closet, just staring at you. The longer you stared at it, the more it seemed to morph into something more sinister. Usually, there were three of us that slept back there, and I was always the oldest. So me being the oldest, they always stuck me closest to the closet, knowing that the other two would put up a fight because they were frightened of what was lurking. I'll never forget this one night. It was myself, my cousin and my younger brother. Hugs and kisses all around and we were tucked in tight for the night. A tap on the touch lamp and the parental units were out of sight, making their way to the door. Watching what little light disappeared along the walls as they closed the door behind them. Pitch black tonight. Couldn't even see your hand in front of your face, it was so dark. Apparently, the moon wasn't shining bright that night because there were no beams of moonlight peeking in from the window. Laying there, I could hear them toss around trying to find a comfortable spot to fall asleep. Not long after snoring, I laid there, glaring into the darkness, uncomfortable as I could ever be. Then I hear a loud crashing noise. Laying there, I'm analysing where it came from. My cousin still sounds asleep next to me, and I can hear my brother in the bed next to us snoring. I didn't hear any of the adults come into the room. I sat up in the bed, scanning the dark room, trying to see what made such a loud noise. Then I pan my eyes over to the closet, where in the back of the closet, I see two red, beady eyes glaring back at me. I gasp and cover myself with my blanket, feeling safe because I can't see whatever was looking at me from under the covers. Just then, 
the bed starts to shake. The old metal frame is creaking so loud it wakes my cousin, and I can hear her in her voice how scared she is as she asks me to stop. She's confused and scared, not knowing why the bed is making so much noise and violently shaking back and forth. She's reaching over to my side of the bed to see if I was next to her, and she realises I'm laying next to her, and she darts straight up in bed, screaming. The bed continues to violently shake for what felt like an eternity. The door then flings open, and there's light filling the room from one of the parents dashing in to see what was going on. As they made their way to the touch lamp and tapped it on, the bed stops. My cousin and myself were both looking at each other with such terror and confusement. Our parents didn't even ask what had happened, but it assumed we were goofing around, jumping up and down on the bed, screaming like wild children when it was past our bedtime. They decided to separate us and stuck me in the twin bed in the corner and placed my cousin and my younger brother in the queen bed this time, thinking this would solve our late night shenanigans. Again, with the tightly tuckins but no kisses. We got Electra, and again, with the fading light along the wall as they descended from the room once more, it took some time to finally succumb to my sleepiness. This time, I was woken up by what felt like hundreds of mice crawling all over me. I had been tempted to sit up, but was held down by an unseen force. I couldn't kick, move or scream for help. I laid there begging for it to stop. Looking down from what I could see was the blanket moving around, like there were little creatures running all over me from under the blanket. Then I saw one scramble from under the blanket at my feet. It slowly turned and darted straight for my face. I remember seeing same, the same red beady eyes from the closet I saw earlier, just running up my body from my feet to my face. I had closed my eyes so tight before it had gotten to my face. I didn't feel the sensation of mice all over my body anymore, but I was too terrified to even open my eyes. I laid there, listening to the room. I gained the courage to open my eyes, and I saw light coming in from the window outside. It was morning. I sat up in bed, saw them laying in the queen bed beside me sound asleep. I turned to look towards the closet and see nothing but the dusty old boxes and junk. Was it a dream? I thought to myself. It wasn't a dream. That was just one night out of many others I had experienced in that back room. It's been years since I've been in that house, and I never plan to go back. I'm not really sure what it was exactly that was in that room, and why it seemed to torture me out of all of us that slept back there. But recently, I found out that when my mother was younger, she had the same experience as I had when sleeping there. So tell me, why would she let us sleep back there if she knew there was something back there? So due to having a family that don't celebrate Christmas, due to religious reasons, I often spend Christmas with my girlfriend and her family. In my girlfriend's room at the top of her wardrobe is a music box which was a gift from her mother from a Christmas years ago, I believe. It's just a little wind up music box that you twist and it plays We Wish You a Merry Christmas. Anyway, we'd all done the standard opening of the presents, pulled some crackers, said Merry Christmas, etc. Then me and the girlfriend and her mum went upstairs to put the presents somewhere out of the way. My girlfriend's mum was talking about how her own mother, who died a few years ago, and how she loved Christmas and wished she could still be there with them all. Straight after that, this music box starts going off on top of the wardrobe, way too high for anyone to have reached and turned, and nobody had even been near that part of the room. Also interestingly, my girlfriend's room was previously her grandmother's room, my girlfriend only moved into the room after the death of her grandmother. My girlfriend's mother believes it to be a message from her own mother, letting them all know she's still with them. We're all not sure, but it was interesting timing nonetheless, and I've no idea how it would have been set off otherwise. The first story is about the parsonage that is beside the church. For those of you who may not know, a parsonage is a house close to the church that the pastor lives in. Anyway, 
At the time that this happened, we had a temporary pastor who had been living in the parsonage for a little over a year. The pastor had a son who was my age and told me and my friend this story. While living in the parsonage, he always had a bad feeling just from being in there. His bedroom was in the basement where this story occurs. One day, our pastors went into the basement to retrieve something from one of the storage areas. When he opened the door to the storage room, he was chased from the basement by a single crow. How the crow, if that is what it really was, got into the basement and then into a closed room is still a mystery to me. The second takes place in the ground floor bathroom. In this bathroom is a storage closet that has an unfinished floor that's just dirt. Pretty common in basements. This area is occasionally called the portal to hell by some of the kids my age due to the uneasy feeling you get from being around it. As I was washing my hands, the door to the closet was pulled open, fast enough to make wind. Luckily, I was only washing my hands because I was out of that bathroom in a second flat. The third story takes place in the second floor bathroom. This bathroom is built up against a storage and maintenance room. During a gathering at the church, I went to an unoccupied area of the church to do my business, because I'm a gentleman. Anyway, as I was sitting there, I heard a loud scratching sound coming from the cinder block wall right behind my head. Trying to stay calm, I told myself something had tipped over in the maintenance room, and that's what made the noise. I finished up and decided to look into the closet. The door, which was normally locked, opened right up to reveal that there was nothing in the room that had tipped, nor was there anything that could have even produced that noise in the first place. I had a friend I made in Indonesia while I worked in Jakarta. I was chatting to her one night via Yahoo Messenger with the video on. This was back in 2010, a few months before I met my wife. I've been chatting to her for some time and at some point I noticed a girl behind her sitting on the floor. She was just chilling out, smiling with legs bent in front of her. I was really amused because my friend had been chatting to me for some time and it turns out she's been ignoring her friend the whole time. So I teased and said, hey, a head just popped up behind you, expecting her to say, oh, that's my friend, such and such. She's just hanging out. Instead, she said, what head? I'm alone. And I say, there's a girl with glasses behind her and she looks totally freaked out. I joked that she had a ghost. I didn't mean it. It just looked like an ordinary young woman. And it kind of looks like the woman ducks down and is gone. I asked my friend to get up so I can see her room and it's empty. She says she's totally alone. My friend looks really frightened and I try to calm her down and say I might have been imagining things, but I only say it to calm her down because she looks so scared. It was late, but at that time I regularly went to bed late and I felt pretty awake because text checking always makes me a bit nervous for some reason. Then. She says that three of her other friends told her they can see a girl in her house, but she's never seen the girl herself. They all described her as wearing glasses, except everyone else, she is wearing different clothes. One, actually two, says it's a red dress. Another, a dark blue shirt, and for me, she was wearing a white sort of blouse, shirt and pants. Her glasses are big and square, and she looks to be in her late teens or early twenties. Indonesians can be hard to age. Anyway, she tells me she basically didn't take her other friends seriously. Indonesians can be a bit superstitious. For example, I had an Indonesian colleague who was training to be some sort of shaman. And my friend was not into any of that stuff. Did not believe in ghosts or have any real religious beliefs. I didn't believe in ghosts either. And if she hadn't looked so freaked out and told me about her friends, I might have put it down to a hallucination. The other thing was that the video window was quite small, but the picture was clear and it wasn't glitchy or blocky. It would be weird if my imagination overloaded a hallucination so perfectly to appear partly obscured by my friend's desk on the floor behind her. The funny part of the story is that we both thought the other person was lying. I thought she was lying there being no one in the room and she thought I was lying and didn't believe I saw someone. Nevertheless. The fact I saw this girl independently of her other friends 
Each of the other three also saw the girl independently of each other, intrigued my friend, and so she asked me questions about her. Although I only saw her briefly, I still remember exactly what she looked like. The next time I chatted to my friend on a different day, we talked about it again. Apparently, she asked more questions of her other friends. She had a friend that claimed to be a psychic that supposedly communicated with the ghost, and the ghost said she liked it in the house, and that she was kidnapped, murdered there, back when the area used to be farmland. My friend lived outside of Jakarta in a place called Deepak. I don't know if I believe any of this bit. I only know what I saw, and what I saw just appeared to be an ordinary young woman. Totally solid, not transparent or anything like that. I went back to Jakarta as part of a Southeast Asian holiday with my wife and met up with my friend. I asked her again if she was playing a joke on me and she still claims she wasn't and we chatted about it again. If she's playing a prank on me, one, she's an amazing actor, she really looked scared when I said there was a girl in her room. Two, she improvised a story about her friends also seeing a girl really quickly. And three, it really wasn't her style of humour. It's made me more open to the idea of ghosts, but being scientifically trained, I still have in my mind that it might have been a joke or a trick of the mind. I kept the transcript of the text chat, though, and it still strikes me as very genuine on my friend's behalf. It's a shame I couldn't save the video, and even if I could at the time, I didn't think I was seeing anything unusual, apart from the fact I thought my friend was being really rude and ignoring a guest. I'd post the transcript, but there are bits of it I find cringy because we had a running joke where we sort of jokingly flirted with each other, but it only makes sense in the context of our friendship and it's a bit embarrassing. This church has been in the same location for nearly 200 years. Although the buildings have been updated, you can't go in the church outside of normal operating hours or in small groups without having an experience. I have several stories that I would like to share, but I'll start with the first thing that happened to us. This took place when we were around 12 to 13 years old. My friend, David, the custodian's son and I, were at the church helping to set up for an event that was to take place later in the evening. While we weren't completely alone, there were only a handful of people in the building, all of whom were on the ground floor. We were tasked with the mission of retrieving a roll of tape from the second floor, so we took a shortcut through the back of the church that has a very narrow staircase that leads directly into the sanctuary. Our destination is the secretary's office, which is right beside the sanctuary. As we're walking through the sanctuary, we both hear what sounds exactly like a very loud heartbeat, coming from no particular area. We run out of the sanctuary before even getting the tape and try to figure out where the sound may have come from, coming up with the conclusion that it was supernatural, considering there's no type of instrument in our church that could have made it, and it was too loud to be coming from the ground floor where everyone else is. Fast forward to a few weeks ago, and we're having a gathering at the church. The area where the previously mentioned staircase is has always been a popular place for the kids to play that is out of the way. So I'm in there with the kids because most of them are my cousins and I like to pick on them. They were all daring each other to go into the small storage area that's under the staircase. My youngest cousin, about five, crawls out from under the stairs and says that he saw something under them. I ask him what it is, to which he replies, I saw a beating heart. He's never heard me talk about hearing a heartbeat, so it gave me chills hearing it. I've also never considered him, him someone to have a wild imagination either. May have been a coincidence, but with all the experiences I've had in that church, I'm tempted to believe him. So, my church is haunted, but there are areas that one might consider a hotspot. These areas are the first floor men's bathroom, the bridal room, which is beside the staircase mentioned in my first story, and the baptismal, which is connected to the third floor bathrooms. After years of being the custodian's son slash part-time custodian, my friend has experienced pretty much all the notable spirits and ghosts that are in the church. One of these spirits 
is little more than a mild inconvenience due to the fact that it likes to throw a wet paper towel in an otherwise clean hallway. My friend had told me about this spirit's antics before the story I'm about to tell occurred. My friend and I were around 16 when this happened. My friend was playing basketball with two other friends from church one day during summer break. This was midday, so there was no one else at the church, and the church remained locked until we decided to go in. Being the custodian's son, my friend had a key. While taking a break from playing, all three of my friends swore that they saw the blinds in one of the windows on the third floor move like someone had brushed their hand from top to bottom. Me, not being a big basketball person and was not at the church to witness this part, immediately after they saw the blinds move, they called me to tell me that they were going to go inside to investigate if I was interested in joining. I arrived a few minutes later and we went in. Obviously, being an old building, the church has a tendency to make noises, but some of these are very distinguishable footsteps. One of my buddies put his phone on the voice recorder and sits in the first pew of the sanctuary while we're wandering about the rest of the building, hoping to record some of the noises we kept hearing. We place the phone down and head to the third floor. Nothing paranormal occurs on our first pass, but for some reason, we decide to take the same exact path that we had just taken over and over. On our second go round is when we notice something strange. There's a broom propped up in the doorway of the men's bathroom on the third floor. This broom was without a doubt not there on the first pass. We don't think much of this until our third trek, when we notice that the broom is still in the doorway, but in a different position. The thing about it was that the broom had not slid out at the bottom, but had been stood up. We continue on this path maybe three or four more times, each time the broom has been moved to a different position in the same doorway. We decided that it had been long enough, so we went to check on the phone that my buddy had put in the sanctuary. We all go in and begin listening to the recording when we realise how stupid of an idea it was, because we couldn't tell what was us and what wasn't. That is, until we hear a loud tap that sounded like someone is coming from a few pews behind the phone. The tapping gets closer, then one more tap even closer. Finally, there was what sounded exactly like a triple tap on the screen of the phone. After listening to the recording, we decided to check on the broom one more time. As we reach the third floor, there are two very obvious things that have changed. One, the broom is now in a different doorway. And two, there is a wet paper towel laying in the middle of the hallway in front of the men's restroom. My friend claims to have seen a reflection that wasn't ours in the window across the hall from us. And that's when we decided that we were done ghost hunting for the day. A couple of years later, one of my buddies is helping his dad, who's a plumber, renovate one of the bathrooms in the church. As they're headed to the bathroom, my buddy spots a familiar sight. In the middle of the hallway, there's a wet paper towel. <laughs>